I want us to access our imaginations this morning. Are you all with me? Andre, you guys, you can hear me here. Christian, you with me? I want us to, act, to access our imaginations this morning, our God-given imaginations um, that the writer of Revelation, through the revelation of Jesus to John, often spoke into and inspired an imagination. So I'm, I'm going to read for about four to five minutes from the end of Revelation because I believe it's important for us to have this imagination as we go into this message today. So I want you to close your eyes, open your imagination and see with me. Enjoy, experience the peace and the presence of God as we read his word and hear the rain outside. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, crying, or any pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 2,200 kilometers in length and as wide as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 65 meters thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. I did not see any temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. 
the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing crops of fruit, yielding its fruit in every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. I believe this will be a healthy lens through which we should receive the message of today. Could you see it? It will be much more than what you could have seen or what we could have read because no eye has seen or ear has heard. Yet what we have read now is incredible. So, moving on from there. What if I tell you that there is something that you can engage and embrace, accept and rejoice in, that will keep you from becoming deceived, that will make you exceedingly Christ-like, that will kill the desire for sin in you. That will lead to exceeding joy. And that will advance the kingdom of God. What if I tell you there is something you can embrace wholeheartedly that will lead to all of that? Would you want to embrace it? Most Christians run away from the very thing that holds this on all these promises. And we do so because of our natural minds and the way the world has taught us. But I would want us to receive the mind of Christ today. So we're going to speak about suffering. Pain that holds promise. And I want to speak about it reverently and not, f not flippantly because suffering is really suffering. And we do suffer when we experience suffering. It's, otherwise it wouldn't be suffering. <laughs> and I know a lot of us experience it. So, But what I have seen is that there is... There's almost a general sense of when I do experience suffering, that I'm looking for a way out. I'm looking to opt out. I speak to a lot of people and the, the moment you're at work and it's unfair and it's hurting, it's causing you damage and you're feeling that it's not right and it's causing you sleepless nights and hardship, you're looking to opt out. I'm looking for a different job because I can't work under that man. We go through suffering in our, at work. We go through suffering in our families. We go through suffering in church. Oh, I don't think any of you have ever gone through suffering at church, have you? We go through suffering in our faith. We wrestle. And suffering in our marriage. Can all the married people raise their suffer ring? Raise your suffer ring. C come on. It's, an, it's a command. Raise your suffering. Now sh show it to your spouse and say thank you for all the suffering that you're bringing on me. 
Come on. The world is avoiding that suffering as well. So 50% of marriages in the world fail. And they say it's the same in the church, but not in the real church of God. Can I just quickly say that? I did a study among us shofar pastors and a few others in other church groups I know. And I, and I, I got to 988 weddings that was conducted over a period of 25 years. And there was a divorce rate in them of 2.12%. So if we accept Jesus as the author of marriage, then it lasts. And we don't have the world's st statistics on us. Isn't that great? But anyway, when the, when the going really gets tough, a lot of the times I find us trying to exit. It's like a, it's like a default. And it is the human default to exit pain, go to comfort. But it's not the Christian default default I want to show you that I want to show you how we are to approach this but I mean even in South Africa a lot of people want to leave South Africa why because they can make more money elsewhere they they see they might be suffering here whether safety wise or economical or whatever they want to leave because of that well, first of all, the gospel never said that we would be rich or safe, but that God would be with us. So we can't leave because of that. We can't leave because there might be suffering. Even if this place burns, if you are called, you will stay. We don't leave when suffering looms. We follow where Jesus leads, wherever that might be. But knowing that where Jesus leads, we will find suffering. So when we're running away from whatever is really hard for us, we have to ask ourselves the question, did I follow Jesus here or did I choose it because I thought it would be awesome for me? Because then if you would find it to be suffering, you would opt out because that's not why you chose it in the first place. You thought it would be awesome for me. But if you follow Jesus there, you can expect suffering and smile and go through it like, Jesus shows us and like we're going to speak about so the first thing is I want you to just take note of where you are suffering just recognize that if you follow Jesus there it might very well be the will of God that you are suffering and if you don't believe me Let's read 1 Peter 2 verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. To this you were called, you are called for what? Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, you were called that you should follow in his, in his steps. We are indeed called to suffering. We are indeed called to suffering. It says that we should, if anyone wants to come after me, Jesus said, we should do what? Pick up our cross. Now for us, the cross is often a religious symbol. But in, those, in that context, it was the instrument of the most painful, shameful, gruesome death you can imagine. That was what he was speaking about. The most painful, gruesome, shameful death. He said, that's what you pick up when you follow me. Is that the faith that you're in for? You see, Jesus did not come to remove suffering. He came to transform suffering. And so suffering eventually has the effects that I'll show you later that I showed you at first in your life if you receive this from God. We cannot be a culture where we want to opt out when we suffer. Because it either means we're running away from Jesus or that we didn't follow him there in the first place. I 
But hold on, pastor. What about perfect peace? What about fullness of joy? What about the things in our congregation we've spent a lot of time speaking about? That he doesn't want you to be anxious at work. He wants you to be full of joy, full of peace. Now, how does this fit in there? With God, it fits in perfectly. But we're at risk, and I was at risk, for spending so much time in trying to get to la-la land, peace land, that I would reject suffering because it would be contrary to where I thought I had to go because the Word of God says, seek peace and pursue it. So then suffering seems contrary, but the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It interprets itself. So you need to read the one thing and the other thing and look at the interpretation that makes both true and you'll know the answer. And I think we see something of that answer in John 16, 33, when Jesus is having his final say to his disciples. And he says, I have said these things to you, and we'll come to what he said just now, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I've said these things to you so that you may have peace. He's promising peace in him. And he's promising tribulation in the world at the same time. Do you see that? So what did he just say? And there are, there are three quick keys in John 16 that he just said so that we may have peace. While we are suffering. The first one. Is he, he says in John 16. I'm not going to go read all that. I'm going to just summarize to you the three things I believe he says there. You can go read it for yourself. He says that suffering will come. Suffering will come. We need to know and expect that following Christ will lead us to suffering. All the Apostles died for their faith. They were martyred for their faith. They knew it would come. They were shown it by Jesus as the example. They ran away because they were not empowered by the Holy Spirit to handle it. Then, then they were empowered and they could make it to the end. But they all faced terrible deaths apart from our beloved John. Who was apparently boiled in oil but didn't die. So they just couldn't get him down. But that's church history, not the Bible, so I'm not 100% sure of that. The first thing is, you need to know. So, psychologically, this is important, because you need to get your expectations in order. So that when it happens, you don't go, what? I thought that God wants the best for me. I thought God is a God of love. I thought God would want me to prosper. And all those things are more true than what you believe. It looks vastly different than what you think. Because the way we think is so conditioned by the way of the world that says what it is to have the good life. But in God, the real good life is hidden somewhere else. And the externals doesn't always look the way that we think it should. So know that you will suffer. That's the first thing. That's an important thing to accept and expect. You with me? The second thing that he says there is, but hey, I must go. Because when I go, the Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit, he's the helper. Oh, we'll need help. He's the comforter. We'll need comfort. He's the advocate. In that moment, we'll know what to say because the Holy Spirit will be there telling us what to say. He's our, our teacher. The Holy Spirit will be there with us and we will run into the comforter. In this world, we receive suffering and people run to what? To comfort. We engage suffering and we should run to what? The comforter. Our ways is different. We don't run to a glass of wine. We run to the Holy Spirit. We don't run away to our house in Hermanus 
to escape and to get some comfort. No. The Holy Spirit might lead us there very well. But we run to the Holy Spirit. Our comforter. So he says you will suffer. But I'll send you the Holy Spirit. That will comfort you. That will be with you. And in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit. There is fullness of joy. You'll sing in jail. And then the last thing is he says you know what. Eternity. Will prove it worthwhile. It's going to be worth it at the end. This is short. You're going to be okay. Now, not many of us have resisted to the point of shedding our blood, have we? Yet we often moan of our suffering and trials and tribulations, whether at work or in relationships or whatever. And they are real and rough. But we must recognize that there will possibly be a greater tribulation than what we currently have. And there is a chance that if we would start speaking out on what we really believe in this nation right now, that many of us would probably end up in jail. Because it's not acceptable anymore. There are hate speech bills being drafted now that if they would be signed into effect, that if you would say anything against anyone that you don't believe the same as, if, you, if we would say that a practicing homosexual man or woman cannot be a leader in our church, I can go to jail for eight years if I would dare to say that, if you would offend anyone. If you would give your children a, a hiding in love, not abuse that's rampant in our country. But in love, as the scripture tells us, you can also do some community service or even go to jail. So we cannot in our country ex expect in the future to be able to live by the word of God and be safe from consequences, persecution, jail time. But our jails need ministers, so I'm ready. That was a declaration. That wasn't a joke. <laughs> or was that nervous laughter? I can see you all at, in front of the, of the parliament uh, with your, you know, picketing for our pastor, free our pastor. <laughs> like one time a uh, um, uh, God came to us in... Uh, Bangladesh as we walked up to the border it was during Ramadan we were on a mission and he walked up to me and he said are you a Christian and I said yes and he said what about them and I said yes so we made it alive as you can see nothing really bad happened but I mean that's what you would face there too if they ask you do you believe the same as that pastor then because our jails are already full aren't they but people are running to, to Canada, Australia, and the Netherlands. Did you know that it's much worse there? Did you know that there you can make a lot of money? But there, spiritually, if you want to go there, you need to be a missionary that's, that's girded up with all the, all, all the power of the spirit going trembling. Then you can go there. Because it's rough there if you want to follow Jesus. It's easy there if you want to go make money. So what kind of a suffering do you want? But even in our country, if you would stay and become poor and be persecuted and thrown in jail, what is that to you? The apostle Paul wasn't accepted by some of the churches he planted later on because he never became rich. He was always poor, working with his own hands. He was always in some kind of trouble, some kind of, of, of court and jail. He was like me. He wasn't very eloquent speaking. So he didn't appear nice in front of everyone. They were ashamed of him. The church in Corinth was ashamed of, of Paul. 
because he went through all these things. But he's the one who writes about peace and joy in the midst of these, of these things. He experienced it. And that's what you think that glass of wine will take you to. Only the Holy Spirit can. So that's how Jesus helps us. He says, you will suffer. The Holy Spirit will help you. And you know what? Eternity, as we read, makes it worthwhile. Because what is one minute in comparison with a lifetime? So what is one lifetime in comparison to eternity? We shouldn't lose perspective. And I know many of you haven't. So what should our attitude be towards suffering then? If we hold to this, if we hold to this, if we understand that our attitude towards suffering should be the same as James and, and as Paul, who says we should consider it pure joy. Now doesn't this sound like Psalm 16? In the presence of God there will be fullness of joy. So at the same moment where th there's fullness of joy, in his presence, it seems that we should find that joy in our suffering. Consider it pure joy. So when it comes, what should your mind do? Self-pity. Again, me, why? Not right, unfair. I can't. Consider it Pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Romans 5, 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. You see, the Apostle Paul there is saying glory. We also glory in our sufferings. That's the word boast. We boast in our sufferings. Now, you might think that sounds rather vain to boast in your sufferings, but that's why I said earlier the Apostle Paul was ridiculed. He was shamed. People were ashamed to be associated with him because he was always in jail and, and poor and shipwrecked and lost somewhere on an island without anything to eat. People were ashamed of him. In his heart, he was glorying in it before God and experiencing the joy that there is in that. So I want us, if we want to make a change of mind, if you want to make a change of mind, just like hold of this again, I want us to make a few declarations before we continue into a bit more detail. I want us to make declarations of these two scriptures scriptures that I've rewritten so that we can declare it over your, you can declare it over yourself. Um, so that's on the next slide. Anybody would want to declare this to your soul? There's four of us at least. Okay, so you just have to be very loud then. Anyone else who'd like to do it? Okay, cool. That, that, that's a crowd. So let's be like, David, and let's just speak to our souls and just, just declare this. And like Andrew Murray used to say that when you come into church and you, and you say and sing things that's way too lofty for where you are at right now, like, I will build my life on your love. I will follow you every day. And you're like, oh, my word, I'm not doing any of that. He says, if you walk into church every time and just beat your breast and say, God, a sinner. Help me. I want that. You can declare it over yourself. Okay. So don't pretend like it is yours, but ask that it would be yours and it will be yours. Are you ready? One, two, three. I consider it pure joy whenever I face trials of many kinds because I know that the testing of my faith produces perseverance. I also glory in my sufferings because I know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Amen. Know that the outcome is so much better. 
if you have suffered through something than if you would not have suffered through something and rejoice. I want to speak about different kinds of suffering because all suffering isn't the same kind of suffering. And it is helpful to distinguish between different kinds of suffering. Because being martyred in Iran versus someone you love being hurt by a criminal is not the same kind of suffering. And it's not the same as a natural disaster. So it's good for us to just take it into perspective and to consider different ways in which we suffer. And I'm going to use 10 of them and I'm going to summarize it into three broad categories. But first, suffering that we go through is creation suffering natural disasters and things happen okay things happen in this world this world's broken so you'll have earthquakes and famines and things like that that will be that's the effect jesus said it would be and it would increase towards the end so when they come you don't say oh god why me they come on us all of us good and bad it rains on the good and the bad and the earthquake comes on the good and the bad okay and we endure that with God, and then it's for our benefit always, even if we are tormented by the results of it afterwards. The next one is, is grief, grief suffering. <laughs> when someone close to you dies, when something terrible happens like that. Jesus wept because Martha and Mary was weeping over Lazarus. Grief, suffering. Then there is consequential suffering. You did something terrible. And now that's going to just have its consequences. We need to face up to those things. You can't run away from those things. If you need to spend jail time, go spend it. To the glory of God. If you need to do something and rectify something, go do it. Face the consequences of your actions. You can be forgiven. Even, but they will still have consequences. If you break my nose with your fist, I can forgive you. But apart from a miracle from God, which can also happen, my nose will not just be fixed the moment I forgive you. Is that so? So there will still be consequences that you will have to pay for at the hospital. Then we've got, we've got victim suffering. So we suffer because someone else did something to us. Like Bathsheba when her husband was murdered by David because he wanted her. I'm very sure she went through a few rough nights with that. In our country, it happens a lot. We suffer as victims. And even in that, you know that scripture I read to this, you were called? That's written to slaves and women who were married to unbelieving Romans. Now, unbelieving Roman husband and a slave master was considered God in their household. They killed who they wanted and they did to you whatever they wanted. And it spoke to Christian slaves and women under such men and told them that you were called to their suffering. That's what that scripture directly speaks about and says, be an example of Christ. But what if the ultimate joy, what if the greatest joy in life is hidden there? And what if the greatest reward for eternity is hidden in imitating Christ? Then even victim suffering becomes glorious, even though I don't want to make it light at all. Empathetic suffering when we hurt because someone else is hurting that we really love. Collective suffering, when we suffer because we suffer, when there's a war, or when the Christians are being martyred in Rome, we all, we all suffer. It's collective suffering. There's, th there's discipline Suffering, suffering because we're not walking in the right way. And Hebrews 12, God disciplines us as his children because he loves us. 
like Peter, he was disciplined by Jesus through that denial because he was arrogant, saying, I'll even die with you, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus said, no, you won't. You'll deny me. And he said, never. He denied him. And Jesus let him go through that hardship for a couple of days until he called him back. When he was resurrected, he said, get the disciples and Peter. Because he knew he wouldn't come. He was too broken. But he came and God restored him. That was his discipline. Holiness, suffering. Jesus in the desert. We suffer when we attain, when we strive towards holiness and we crucify the flesh. There's a suffering in that. There's opposition suffering when, you would be, when people would come against us. Like the hate speech bill would bring opposition suffering in our face. And we might face the consequence of it. Like Stephen was stoned. And missional suffering. As we go, we might suffer. For a little while, we are to suffer grief in all kinds of trial. I can maybe quickly just um, summarize them in three categories. There is suffering because you follow Jesus. Necessarily, because you follow Jesus. Empathetic suffering because you love. Collective suffering because we are one holiness suffering because those who have come to Christ have crucified the flesh with these passions and desires. Opposition suffering because they will come against us from the world at your workplace, wherever that is. And missional suffering, wherever we are called to go to, the devil will be in our faces. Because you're a sinful human, we suffer because of that. Now that's not only because you follow Jesus, that's because you're a sinful human. Okay? That's different. But God will still make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work together for my good. I like that song, but they just take away the qualification qualifier like those who love God and are called according to his purpose not just anyone but he will make it work together for your good if you engage him on it because you're a sinful human you get consequential suffering and you get disciplined suffering and then because the world is broken we get creation grief victim and also forms of collective suffering but all of these ones Jesus came to transform some he actually he came to load it on us and ask us if if we will if we will bear it with him others he just says we will endure them but i've come to transform suffering so that you will find the greatest treasures of life and joy in the midst of it because then when my little children are the most scared they run the closest to me and they cling the closest to me isn't that so? And that's what we do as well. The purpose of suffering, and then I'm just about done. A few things we read in Scripture is that it purifies our faith. It makes deception and lukewarmness something we don't have to worry about too much. Now, this is specifically suffering as a Christian, suffering for good and righteousness' sake. It leads to imitating Christ, to becoming like Christ, because we suffer with Him, as He did. It leads to character building, like we read in Romans 5. It's very hard to build character. It's very hard to change the way you think and act and feel about it. It's very hard. But suffering is a tool that, takes us to those dark places where change needs to happen. And for when that change happens in the dark places, and it happens with truth and not lies, and the comforter rather than comfort, and the presence of God rather than a glass of wine, then comes out the good fruits of a, of, of a character that looks like Jesus. It actually says in one Peter 4, 1, that those who have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. It, it seems that it kills your desire for sin in you. 
if you suffer. Now that's something I wouldn't mind. But please still join for the Conqueror series. It leads to exceeding joy as we suffer with him. And it advances the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul goes so far and says, I fill up in my sufferings what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ towards you. Towards you. What is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, it seems like blasphemy, towards you, is the fact that now you who didn't see him on that cross have an example of what that looks like. And so I fulfill what he did to you, the Apostle Paul says, by suffering for your sake. And so we are examples to those around us of him, imitating him, being Christ, by sacrificially, literally, sacrificially loving and showing him. And I think the scripture that summarizes this the best is 2 Corinthians 4, 17. The Apostle Paul, again, he speaks about himself being shipwrecked a couple of times and receiving like the most intense Ends beatings and, and, and stonings and things that none of us have, comp- has, have experienced. And he says, he calls it light and momentary affliction. So what is it that I'm currently working through? <laughs> My boss is not very nice to me right now. I mean, is that a blip on the radar? And now I'm not making light of our suffering because... God knows our hearts and he really cares for them and he doesn't want to make light of it. But it is good, like Paul, to say that what I'm experiencing right now says for our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that is far beyond comparison. In comparison to the eternal glory that's coming that we read, all suffering seems light and momentary. And Paul knew suffering. And Paul said, I know a man who's been to the third heaven. He saw a few things. He might have seen a few things that would help him to endure. And would help him say that this is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. So I will endure. So I want us, church, to... Accept and not reject when we suffer. Accept the fact that we will and when we are accepted in God, with God. That this might very well be the will of God. He says we are called to suffer with them. I want us to, after we've accepted, and I think quite a few of you have in your heart at least cognitively said right now, I, 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 I recognize I need to do that. And that's hard. The Holy Spirit helps us. We need to renounce the fear because I'm, I'm, I'm scared, man. I don't want to be uh, tortured like the heavenly man was. Have you read that book? That scares me. Not a lot of other things scare me that much. If I read that thing, I'm like, oh, I could actually go through this. But with my God, I will. And so will you whatever he calls us into. Renounce the fear in the light of the love and the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Then you expect it and you're not surprised when it comes on to you. You're not surprised by the fiery ordeal. And then when you have accepted it, you've renounced the fear, it's with you, then you endure it with the Holy Spirit. You don't run to comfort, you run to the comforter. You don't run further out, you run deeper in. And you find the hidden joy that's there in the presence of God in the midst of suffering that I don't think you can find in any other way or any other place. And then you rejoice. Whether you feel it or not, you rejoice prophetically if you don't feel it. But very soon you will. Like a runner at the end of the 100 kilometer trail run, they feel like they want to die. But they know it's worth it because the end is close. So they're not going to stop. Even though they really are at risk of 
dying. They'll probably, my father once was crawling for the last couple of meters in the comrades. He was one of those, of those guys. My mom thought it was the end and it was really horrible. But he can't even remember getting across the line. But he did. There was just no way he was going to give up through all, all that suffering straight into the medical tent after that. And he's still with us, praise God. Um, but we rejoice and we don't go into self-pity mode. Okay, that's from the devil. Self-pity is from the devil. I also do it. But I'm reminding myself right now and all of you. So we should have a change in our attitude towards suffering. Let's read this scripture together as well as we close and believe it. One, two, three. For our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that is far beyond comparison.